Okay, welcome back. What we've seen so far are a few Unix commands. How to create a directory, how to change directories, how to get the head or tail of a file, how to just cat a file to the screen, how to remove a file with RM, and how to run nano, which is a simple text editor that I hope you don't ever use for real programming. We've also seen a few extra things that aren't really commands, but are just as important. Dot dot means the directory above me. Greater than means redirect my output. Vertical bar means pipe. Take the output of one command and use it directly as the input for another. And history means show me what I've done. Pressing tab will auto-complete based on what you've typed so far. Using up arrow and down arrow will go through the history so that you can edit it or rerun it directly to reduce typing, reduce strain on your hand, go faster, and make fewer mistakes. So we've seen about seven commands and about seven other ideas. And that's a nice digestible lump for one tutorial session because we have to talk a little bit about some more psychology before we dive into the next topic. Your brain gets tired. Physiologically, fatigue poisons build up and after about an hour, anywhere from 45 minutes to 90 minutes, your attention starts to flag and you've all felt that. You've all been in that meeting. Everything's going fine, people are talking, it's productive, I understand what's going on, and then you feel yourself hit that wall. That's the same wall you hit when you've over-exercised a muscle and you can't lift the next weight. It's the same wall you hit when you've run as far as you're going and now your reserves are depleted. Your brain is a physical mechanism and like any other piece of your physiology, it suffers from fatigue. And this is why an hour is about a natural time scale in human activity. It's built into us. So if any lesson takes longer than an hour, you're wasting people's time. If any meeting takes longer than an hour, you're wasting people's time. Once they hit that fatigue threshold, error rates go up, retention goes down. One of the things you can do to counteract this is get a little bit of exercise every hour or so. Get up, leave your office, walk around the building. Walk down, get a coffee, come back. It's not the coffee, it's the act of walking. The blood flows, you get a bit more oxygen, it helps flush some of the fatigue poisons. It gives you a few minutes away from the keyboard and screen to reflect on what you've been doing. Switching from programming to Facebook does not actually give your brain a rest. One of the spookiest experiences of my life was teaching at a military academy. At five minutes to the hour, when the bell rang for the end of the lesson, 40 young men and women got up, took off their dress uniform jackets, hung them on their chairs, got down, and started doing push-ups. Not a word was spoken. It completely freaked me out. And I said to one, one of them stood up, I said, what is this, you've got a quota? And he said, no, no, that's just for the first years. We're seniors. I said, so what is it? And he explained rather patiently they'd actually been taught about attention and focus and exercise because they have to remain sharp under very difficult conditions for extended periods of time. So they've actually learned how to do that. It's a subject that they have to study and master. I think that faculty meetings would run a lot better if people knew a little bit more about the physiology of mental fatigue. What I want you to do when you're programming is work for 45 minutes to an hour and then get up and take a break. You will be able to get more done in your entire day it's not cheating to take the break and it isn't really time away. What you're doing is resetting so that that decline that has set in can be fixed and you can go back to peak performance. You will actually get more done in a day if you aim for six or seven hour long blocks of productivity with breaks than if you try to do one long sprint. Okay? That means that when you're programming or analyzing data, you need to break the work into chunks that will fit into that hour. Because here's the other thing we know. There's a mental state called flow. 
where you're very focused on your task, where the rest of the world drops away, time just stops mattering, and you are deep into the problem you're trying to solve. You are much more productive in that state, that concentrated, focused state, than you are when you are multitasking or being interrupted. Yes, there's a lot of noise out there about how the current generation with iPhones and Facebook and all of these other toys can multitask. The studies say it's false. The brain can't switch between tasks or give partial attention to several things effectively for extended periods of time without suffering productivity. So, if you want to stay effective, you need to get into that state of flow and stay there. The problem is, any interruption that causes you to switch tracks, that causes you to switch tasks, it will require about 10 minutes to get back up to peak mental performance, regardless of how brief the interrupt was. So if the phone rings and you just glance over to see who it is, and then you come back, it's broken your concentration, you've now got to climb that hill to get back up to peak. Well, if it takes 10 minutes to get to peak, then six interrupts an hour is enough to ensure that you're never actually working at peak. And if you take a look at most people's desktops, take a look at how many interrupting applications they have open, it's pretty clear that most programmers, most people working with computers, aren't allowing themselves to get to peak. So, one thing you can do is work for 45 to 50 minutes with mail switched off, with Twitter and Facebook and everything else switched off, and then take a 10 or 15 minute break, 10 minutes of which is go and walk around and catch your breath, get the blood flowing, get some oxygen into your system, and then check your email. Just rattle through messages, I don't need to pay attention, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Oh look, there's five messages in this thread, I only need to respond to the last one. It's a more efficient use of your time, and it ensures that when you need to be at peak, you are at peak for an extended period. It's a hard discipline to get into, just like exercising regularly or eating well is a hard discipline to get into. But, the difference in productivity is amazing. So. Now that we know that, you understand why it is that we break these lessons up into chunks that are about a certain size, and why it is that we insist, at least your instructor should have insisted, that before we dive into the next chunk, you actually get up out of your chair and go somewhere and then come back to sit down with lungs full of fresh air, with blood pumping through your system, renewed, reinvigorated, re-energized, and raring to go. So here we are. We are in the toot directory, and the only file we have is still fish.txt. We're going to create some more files eventually, but let's keep working with this one. There's our cat fish.txt, and notice by the way that I typed cat f tab. I didn't type fish.txt. Okay. I'd like to see how many different species we saw. Looking at it, I see that, or how many days we saw a particular species. We saw marlins on two days, we saw sharks on three days, I think we only saw tuna one day, flying fish, cod, and turtle one day. So for a file with ten lines, that's pretty easy. If I've got a thousand lines of data to process, I don't want to be counting things by hand. I'll get it wrong. I want to get the computer to sort and count and organize my data for me. Head and tail are not actually particularly useful commands. We showed them to you because they're simple and because they allow us to introduce the idea of redirection and pipelines. Now that we have those tools, we can come back and start to do things you might actually want to do with your data. Let's start by saying cut delimiter is comma field one fish.txt. Now, this looks pretty complicated, but it isn't. Cut is the command. Dash D means here's the thing I use to separate columns of data. Cut's job is to cut columns out of a data file. I have to tell it what's the separator between columns. In this case it's the comma, but in other cases it could be tab or colon or vertical bar or something else. 
Different data files will use different conventions. Comma is probably the most common. So this is an option, dash D, that takes an argument. Dash D means I'm about to tell you what the delimiter, the separator, is. Comma is the actual separator. Then I say I want field, dash F, number one. And I'm doing this to fish.txt. There you go. It's cut the first column out of my data and is showing it to me. What if I go up arrow, go back, and ask for column two? That gives me the species names. What if I go 2-3? It gives me species and count. Okay, so I've now got a way to select fields vertically in the same way that head and tail select horizontally. Okay, I can go up and do this, and now I've got the names of all of the species. All right, if I want to see how many days I saw a particular species, I've now got one record with just that information, but now I've got to coalesce it somehow. Let's take that command and run it through sort. Sort does exactly what you would expect. Takes its input and sorts it alphabetically. It actually uses phone book order. If you've got a mixture of digits and numbers and parentheses and other characters, it uses the same order that a phone book would use. The digits come before the letters and so forth. So you can see that the word species comes first because capital S comes before any lowercase letters. Uppercase comes before lowercase. And then I see cod, flying fish. There's my two marlins. There's the three days on which I saw the shark. There's tuna and turtle. So right away it's going to be easier for me to see what I got and how often. 